Hebrews chapter 13. I mean, one of the most explicit Bible verses related to the matter of thanksgiving is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. And some of you are going, well, then why did you just tell me to go to Hebrews? Well, the reason why is because this verse says plainly, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I mean, this, this verse commands believers to give thanks to the Lord, not for everything, but in everything. There's a big difference, uh, isn't there? The fact that you're not thanking God for everything, but you're, there's a difference in thanking God for, uh, for everything that happens in your life, but it's in, in everything that, uh, that you're giving God thanks for. I mean, we ought to be thankful, not just because we are told to be thankful, but because we have much to be thankful for, don't we? And you say, well, pastor, this is not a Thanksgiving sermon. Well, you know, the thing is, let's look at Hebrews chapter 13. Let's read Hebrews uh, uh, chapter 13 and see what it says. It says, let brotherly love con uh, continue. Be not forgetful to uh, entertain strangers, for thereby some entertain angels unawares. Remember the, uh, them that are in bonds as bond, uh, bound with them, and them uh, uh, which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the, be uh, the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and idolaters God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. In other words, be happy with what you have. Don't always desire for, to have what others have. Let's continue. It says, For he hath uh, said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith of follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Isn't it great to know that God is uh, he's unchanging, that no matter what happens in this world, this ever-constant changing world, that God is the same no matter what. Verse 9. Be not carried about with, uh, with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have uh, not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat uh, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is, bro uh, is uh, brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffer, or suffered without the gate. Let us go therefore, forth therefore unto uh, him without the camp, bearing his uh, reproach. For here uh, have we... No continuing a city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of, uh, of our lips giving thanks uh, to his name. But to do uh, good and to uh, communicate, uh, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey them that uh, have the rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account, that they may, uh, they may do it with joy and not with grief, for it is unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for, uh, for we trust we have a good conscience in all, all things willing to live honestly. But I beseech you, I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may uh, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the grace of the, so now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord uh, Lord Jesus the great that great Shepherd of the sheep through the blood of an everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ to whom. Be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints, they of Italy, salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit this morning, that you would give me clarity of thought and speech, Lord, that I would convey your, your truth. Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear your word and not only hear it, but, Lord, that we would uh, put it into practice. Lord, we would apply it to our lives, that we would do what your word ha would have us to do. God, may we be continually uh, built up in the faith. In Jesus' name, amen. But one of the things that I notice is a very fickle thing, you know, that we see this morning is thankfulness. Oftentimes we are thankful for certain things, you know, we, we, but the things that we, uh, that we focus our thankfulness on are usually physical in na uh, nature. We are often, you know, physical, or sorry, we're often thankful for our health. We're often thankful for our families and our homes. We are often, you know, thankful for our financial stability. We are often thankful for the things that we have. Yet, all of these things are subject to change. And I'm not saying that it's wrong for you to be thankful for those things. But here's the thing. If we think about it for a moment, our health can break. Our families can, you know, split up and bank accounts can run dry. And it might be, you know, due to inflation. But what do we do then? How does that affect our thankfulness? If those things were to all of a sudden turn on us, would we still be thankful in, the, uh, in, in, in life, in those things? Well, this morning I'm going to focus on verses 5 through 15 and see what the Bible has to say um, about these things. I, I want to suggest that we, would, that we remain thankful for those physical blessings that we enjoy. And that we learn to look beyond those, uh, those changing things to some things that never change. There are certain things in our life that will never change change. I want to share you know, with you for a few moments the unchanging blessings with you. I want us to look at the unchanging reasons for Thanksgiving. And as the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians, I want us this morning, as I've titled this message, in everything, give thanks. Number one, one of the first things that we ought to realize that is unchanging, an unchanging reason for us to be thankful is this, our Savior. Our Savior. We ought to be thankful for our Savior. Amen? Let's look at verses 5 and 6 again, and verse 8. It says, Let your conversation uh, be without covetous, uh, covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For, for he hath uh, said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. See that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Let's drop down to verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. These verses, uh, you know, these verses tell us of just a few of the unchanging glories of our Lord. The things uh, revealed here are causes for us to be thankful at all times. I mean, think about this. How many of us are thankful, we see this in verse 5, of, for His abiding presence, for the, of the abiding presence of the Lord, regardless of the path of life, regardless of where the path of life leads, the saint of God will never walk alone. We know the Bible says what? That he will never leave us nor forsake us. I mean, how often is he going to leave us when the Bible says never? Never means never, right? He's never going to leave us. We have that, we, like I said, we have that, his abiding presence. Look at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. It says, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I mean, this is the Lord speaking. He says, you know, and then everything that we do, he's going to do what? He's going to help us. He's going to be right there beside us. He's not going to leave us, right? Are you thankful for his abiding presence? Are we thankful for his assisting presence? The word helper, uh, you know, the helper in verse 6 you know, uh, that it talks about uh, here comes from a word which means to run. In other words, the idea is that we are in need 
and the Lord runs to our aid. When you, when you are in need, when you need help, what does God do? He runs to your aid. He is right there with you. He is our comforter, as it's talked about according to John chapter 14, verse 16. In other words, one, uh, one, uh, one is one called alongside of another to give aid and comfort. That's our God. That when in those times that we need aid, that we need comfort, that we need help, God is right there with us. He hasn't left us. I'm thankful for his anchoring presence, his anchoring pre- presence. One of the greatest, greatest sources of thanksgiving this morning is in the truth that Jesus Christ never changes. What he was then is what he is now. He has not changed. From before creation onto eternity, Jesus has never, nor will he ever change. He is the great I am. He still possesses all power in heaven and on earth, according to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. We can always be thankful for our Savior. Always. Another thing that I'm thankful for, one thing that's ever changed, you know, that's never changing, is our salvation. Is our salvation. Let's look at verses 9 through 12. It says, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have, uh, have not profited them that have, uh, have been occupied therein. Verse 10, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which uh, serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose uh, blood is bought, uh, brought into the sanctuary by the high priest uh, for sin are burned without the camp. Verse 12, Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might uh, sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. So we see in here, you know, the fact of, uh, I'm thankful for that unchanging reality of his salvation. But here's the other thing. What was the price of it? What was the price of us receiving salvation? Well, for one thing, this verse mentions grace, God's grace, that we, we can be thankful, that we can you know, thank God that salvation is given without cost. You say, well, how is that possible? Let's look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. It says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him come. Take the water of life freely. In other words, you know what? God did everything for you. The cost is free. He did everything for you in that. That it was it cost him everything. And yet for us, all we have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing: it's not just for a select few. Some churches would teach, you know, uh, you know, teaches the uh, would teach these things that you have to. Be special in order to get into heaven. What do I mean by that? There's, there's this idea or this thought that came from John Calvin that says that there's only a certain number of people that will be saved, that, you know, that God only saves those some, and then the other ones are just cast into hell, that no matter what, you have no choice. But what does it say in Revelation 22? It says, whosoever will, let him take, take the, of the water of life freely. Whosoever will. Who is the whosoever will? You and I. Everybody in this world has that opportunity in order to receive salvation. Amen? It's not just offered to, you know, to the few select you know, and few. And the amazing thing you know, for those that you know, would believe that John Calvin is correct, it's amazing that the ones that say, you know what, yeah, John Calvin only gave salvation you know, just for the few select that, that is there. Well, it's amazing. You, you know Why? Because the ones that believe that are the ones that actually believe his teaching. In other words, if you believe it, you know, according to what he says, not according to what the Bible says, but according to what he says, then amazingly enough, then you're saved. Right? That's not how it works. The Bible says, whosoever will shall come. It is, you know, it is purely, our salvation is purely the operation of grace. It's purely by grace alone. Think of it how, uh, how, you, uh, how you came to know him. You were dead in your sins, and he sought you. He called you. He died for you. He redeemed you, and he 
keeps you. Right? All you can do, all you did was exercise the faith that he gave you. He did it all for you. Everything about salvation, God did for you. The only thing, you, the thing is, is that you can say, well, you know what? It was me that, you know, that called upon him. That was your exercise of faith that he gave you to do it. So it's not about you. It's all about him. That salvation is because of him. That price that he paid is because of him. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I mean, it's been said before, I'll say it again. If we could boast about us getting saved, we would. If I could sit there and go over and say, Joseph, you know what? I, I gave up a lot more than you did in order to get saved. I am so much better than you. Is that how it is? No. That's why it says, lest any man should boast. Whatever, whatever, you know, whatever you know, wickedness you know, was in me, God saved me. Whatever wickedness was in Joseph, whatever was in Doug, whatever was in, I mean, whatever's in, in us, it was all the Lord that saved us. Amen? It's not us. It's never been us. It's never been about us. And we should stop thinking, hey, it's all about me, because it's not about you. It's about the Lord and what he did. Because why? Because he paid the price for us. He also paid the pain for it. For us, the price was pretty low, wasn't it? All we had to do was exercise the faith that he already gave us. But for God, the price was unimaginable. Our salvation cost God the life of his only begotten son, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. His death on the cross is what provided salvation for you and I. There is no way that we can adequately describe the gory details of the death of the Lord Jesus. But the prophet Isaiah tells us something about what he suffered. Isaiah chapter 53 Let's look at verses 4 and 5, or sorry, 4 through 7. It says this. Surely he hath bore our griefs, griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. And we have turned everyone to his own way. Did you hear that? To his own way. That's us. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord bore our sins and put it upon, his, upon him in order to take our sins away. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is... Uh, he is uh, brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep before his shears is dumb or is quiet or does not speak. So he opened not his mouth. That's what the Lord did for us. That's the pain that he suffered for us. But there was a purpose in it. There was a purpose in it. We are told that he suffered death and he did so that he might sanctify the people. That word sanctify means to separate from vain things or wicked or dirty things or defiled things and set them apart for God's use. So God took your dirtiness, your filth, your shame, all those things, and he says, I'm going to make you of use for God's glory. So anytime the devil wants to you know, keep on bringing up the stuff that's in your past that God has already saved you from and cleansed you from, just remind him that you're no longer that same person. Amen? Amen? This is, that's the whole reason why Jesus Christ died, that he died to take vile sinners out of their sins and set them apart from this world for the glory of God. He saved us so that we might become different and that God, uh, that God may be able to use us for his glory. Isn't it amazing in the fact that God uses us? I mean, think about it. He uses us to share the gospel with others. He, shares, he uses us to be an example to those around us through our actions. He uses us to be the light in a dark world. He uses us. And some of you may be sitting in your seat thinking, man, I don't know if God did the right thing because, I mean, I think about it almost every single day. I'm saying, Lord, why would you use me? 
Why? Because it's not about me. It's about him. And God's the one who chose that way because you know what? God says, you know what? I can change you. I, can, I, I already saved you. I know I can change you. Let's look at uh, you know, 1 Timothy chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. This is what he did to the, uh, you know, with the Apostle Paul. He says, I thank, God, uh, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful and putting me, uh, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer. This is Paul saying this. He was a blasphemer. He, he said all kinds of wickedness against God. He says, and a, a persecutor and injurious. He used to go around killing people and hurting people for the gospel, for what he thought was the gospel, which wasn't. He says, but I, what, attained mercy because I did, uh, did it ignorantly in unbelief. So not every single person that rejects Jesus Christ is doing it because they hate God. But a lot of times it's because they're fact that they're ignorant and that they were in unbelief, just like the Apostle Paul was. It says, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of exception, uh, exception that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's what Paul says. And oftentimes I sit there and I think, how, I mean, I could write that same thing about myself. The fact that, you know what, that he came into the world to save a sinner like me and that I am chief just like the Apostle Paul. But God saves us. He uses us that we all have obtained mercy. Why? Because Christ thought you were worth it. Amen? The third thing I'm thankful for. The third thing, you know, the unchanging reason of, of being thankful and giving thanks is this, our separation, our separation. Verse 13, it says this, Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. The call of this verse is for us to do, uh, to do on the outside what God has already done on the inside. God has, uh, has changed you, has he not? Has he not cleansed you? Has he not, made your, has he not uh, revived your spirit? Has he not made you born again in your spirit? That he has set us apart inwardly through the redemption of his blood. His call to us is that we willingly take our stand with Jesus on the outside of the, the world. He called, uh, he's calling us to pick up our cross and bear his reproach. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 says this, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is why he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31, and he says, I die daily that we are to bear his reproach, that we are to go about the fact of telling people about Jesus Christ what he went through to save them, uh, you know, to save them and also to save us. He is telling us to be different. He's telling us to be different. Second Corinthians chapter six, uh, 6, verse 17 says this, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. This is why he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he says that he has made us into a new creation. That, the old, that the, thing, uh, the old things have passed away and all things have what? Become new. That we ought to thank the Lord that he has made a change in us. The fact that, that, we, do not, uh, that we don't live like we used to that we don't find enjoyment in all the things that the world is running to, that we are different is a cause for rejoicing every single day of our life. Remember last week, you know, we talked about the fact that we oftentimes want to like, tackle every single sin in our life all at one time. It is, that's a hard thing to do, is it not? That's why the Apostle Paul, I believe, you know, begins to talk about that we are in a race. Because what we do is that, you know what, we don't focus on the person that's all the way in front of us. We don't focus on the hundreds of, hundreds of other sins that are in our life. What we do is we focus on that sin that's directly in front of us, and we begin picking them off one by one as we, uh, as we get over them, as we, uh, we, we continue to go. That we ought to stand out 
like he says here, and that we should be thankful when we do. Oftentimes people, you know, uh, you know, look at the fact that they're standing out and they're like, I don't want to stand out. I don't want people to notice me. God wants people to notice you for good reasons. He wants, you know, people to, uh, he wants those people around you to realize if they can change you, they can change them. People will sit there and they may make fun of you, they may mock you, but the thing is, is that oftentimes if they have a prayer request, they will come to you first. Why? Because you're different. And they see that in you. Be thankful for that. Don't sit there and look at it as a bad thing. It's a good thing. The fourth unchanging reason for being thankful is this. Our sanctuary. Not this sanctuary, but our sanctuary. Again, I'm reminded that, that we are living in a world that is constantly changing. Is it not? The world is not the same that it was in 2010 or the fact that in 2000, I mean, think about it. Back in 2000, we were all, actually, sorry, 1999, we were all worried that when we hit 2000, that all of our computers were going to blow up. Remember that? What called Y2K? All because the computer could not figure out the clock. And some of us have a VCR at home that still has the clock blinking 12 because they could not figure out the clock. Right? Some of the kids in here are going, what are you talking about? A VCR? A blinking clock? What is that? I don't even know. Mom, you know, Mom, Dad, what kind of ancient stuff is he speaking of? I remember we had one growing up, and that clock, I mean, that VCR blinked 12 o'clock all the way up until that VCR died because we could never figure out that clock. Am I the only one? Is your clock still blinking in your 12? All right. But if all of our hopes are placed in this world and in the physical realm, then we are going to be disappointed more than we are happy. If all of our hope is in this world and in the things that we can get and all these things or whatever, more times than not, we're not going to be happy. If, if we focus on those things in this temporal world, why? Because this is not our home. This is not our home. Heaven is our home. The child of God can rejoice in the fact that this world is not the end-all, tell-all of the Christian experience. Let's look at uh, verse 14 of uh, Hebrews chapter 13. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. The previous chapter you know, uh, talks about that, that, it, you know, that we seek after a... Uh, a city that does not fade, that does not change. What city is that? Heaven. Verse 14 tells us that there is something better than, you know, there's something better just down the road. That just because life is hard right now, that trials and tribulations are hard, that life here is hard, does not mean that we give up. That means, you know what? There's something better down the road. Because you know what? This is not the end all. This is just the start, and it gets better for the believer. Why? Because here, this is not heaven. But here's the thing. For your unsaved loved ones and you know, the un, you know, your unsaved enemies that you have, this is the best that it's going to get for them, apart from Christ, unless Christ saves them, right? This is the best it's ever going to get. You say, well, how's that possible? Because if they're not saved and they die, they go where? They go to hell, right? But for the believer, this is the worst that it ever gets. This is the worst that it will ever be. Because, you know, the Bible, ta- you know, Bible says that for the believer, yes, we die, but then we go on to glory. And we know there's a place that, that has no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more sadness, sadness. None of those things are there. That we get a glorified body. That this body Just, I, I don't even know, that you know what, lets me down every single day in some way, shape, or form. I don't have to worry about this body anymore. Because I'm going to get a glorified body that's not going to wear out. I know that as I get older, I know that this body is not going to last. That I'm going to get weak and everything else and all these things. That stuff is going to begin to break down that it already has begun to break down. But when I get to heaven, I'm going to receive a body that's not going to let me down. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that fact. 
I mean, we can thank the Lord this morning that when this journey is over, we have a city awaiting us where we can rest from the labors and where we can enjoy the sweet presence of the Lord. That is, it's a place of which we know little of. You say, well, yes, we do. We know what the Bible says. I don't know about you, but when I've read what the Bible says about heaven, I begin to think about it and go, how is that even possible? I, I, I try to you know, wrap my mind around the whole situation about, about heaven. And as good as I can possibly make it in my brain, it doesn't even compare to what it actually is when I'm going to see it. It's un, uh, unimaginable how, how awesome and amazing it's going to be. That we, uh, that we know that none of, but here's the thing, is that we know that none of the problems that we have in this life are allowed there. You know that? That none of the problems in this life are allowed there. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. This is what I was alluding to earlier. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no, uh, neither uh, sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Aren't you thankful for that? That we, uh, that we do know that we will be there with Jesus as well, right? John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3 says this, Let your heart, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, that there ye, uh, ye may be also. God says, you know what? I have prepared a place for you, and the thing is that if I told you, you know what's going to happen, and he's going to come again for us. Here's the thing is, for those that, you know, out there that, that believe that somehow, some strange way that the rapture has already happened, and that somehow, for some odd reason, that we're still here, I don't know what they're on, because Jesus Christ himself said, I will come again. He is going to come back for his church. He is coming back for his church. It's not a matter of, well, what happens if he decides not to? No, he does not lie. He will come back for his church. And that's the one day that I'm going to sit there and say, thank you, Lord, that I'm able to fly. <laughs> this morning, and I close with this, we need to take a close look at the real blessings of the Lord. Let us be, you know, let's be thankful for all the things that God gives us, right? Let's praise him for our health, for our families, for our financial blessings, and so forth, right? Let us not take them for granted. Don't take those things for granted. Earlier this year when I was sick and I had those different things, various illnesses going on in my life, I said, you know what, at those times I sat there and said, Lord, I don't understand why I'm going through this. I don't understand why, but God, I don't thank you, uh, but I thank you that I'm still alive. Oftentimes, we, we can have all kinds of situations and scenarios happen, all kinds of different health reasons and going on, and we can sit there and, and, and begin to say, why me, Lord? Why? Why did this happen? Why? Why? And we can get to that point to where we're so despondent, to where we're like, you know, the prophet Elijah said, Lord, just take me now. But here's the thing. We could also look at it like Job did. I'm not, wishing, I'm not you know, praying or wishing a one-to-one -one, you know, thing of what happened to Job to happen to you. I'm not. For those that don't know, Job, because of the fact that he was faithful, that he was doing what God had have him to do, that he was doing what God had asked him to do, Satan you know, came up, you know, actually, sorry, the Lord originally came up to him and said what? He says, what about my servant Job? And Satan uh, comes back and says, well, you know what? I would go after him, but it's because, you know, you have your hand upon him. You have all these things going for him. If you were to, you know, remove your protection from him, he would curse you to your face. And what did God say? Do what you want to him. 
except not take his life. And what did Satan do? He took him up on it, didn't he? He lost his kids. He lost, you know, he lost his family, all of his servants, lost all of his livestock, his, his livelihood, lost everything. And then after that, if that wasn't enough, Satan said, you know what? We'll throw, we'll throw like some boils on you. Have some pain to where the only way you can get relief is by basically scratching yourself with pottery. That was because Job did right in the eyes of the Lord, that he was upright. So maybe that time, you know, that you sit there in that circumstance, you say, God, I don't understand why this has happened. Just say, you know what, God, I thank you, Lord, that in everything I can give you thanks. Because at the end of that, God restored all to him at the end. Let us learn to be thankful. And the thing is that oftentimes when things are going on in your life and you know that you... You're like, I've been faithful to follow God. I, I, I've been thankful you know, for him. I've been faithful. I've been doing all these things. How many of you know that your friends and your family will begin to, well, you must have done something wrong, right? They'll, they'll be the first ones to sit there and say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's maybe this, this, and this. And you know what? It may not be any of those things. God just may be testing you. God may be testing you. Like I said, I'm not wishing anything like what Job experienced to, any, to happen to anybody that's listening to me this morning. But I'm saying, instead of, you know, the next time I was sitting there saying, why me? And just say, you know what? God found me faithful. God found me faithful. So let's, let us learn to be more, fa- uh, more thankful for those things which we can never lose. And the thing is, is that if we, by chance, die, is it so bad? Is it so bad if we were to die? I don't have a death wish this morning. I'm not trying to, you know, say I want everybody to begin to go, go yeah, I just want to die. I just want to, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is it a bad thing if we do? No, why? Because if you're saved, you're on your way to heaven. And it's better for you there than it is here. I'll tell you that right now. Like I said, I'm not, uh, I don't have a death wish this morning. I'm just saying, if we do die, it's not the, bad, you know, the worst thing. I've heard so many people, so many people, believers included, Well, at least I'm not dead. The Apostle Paul said, you know what? It would be better for me to be dead, but you know what? For your sakes, I'm still here. Why? Because we're with him when we die, right? Let us learn to be ever thankful for those things that we cannot change, that if we're saved, we're on our way to heaven. That I'm thankful, you know, I'm thankful for his salvation, I'm thankful, you know, uh, uh, for all the things, you know, uh, this morning that, uh, that I listed. When all the physical bla- uh, blessings have faded and we, f- and we can find no reason, f- uh, you, know, to pray, you know, to praise God in them, let us thank God that there are things that will never change. In, the, uh, in, all, in these things, we have an unchanging reason for eternal thanksgiving. This morning, as I said, and I close with this, right? And I do. This morning, as I open up the altars this morning, why not come before the Lord right now and just thank Him for who He is and for what He has given you and I? Why is it every single time that we come to the altars, it's got to be something horrible? Why can't we just go to the altar and say, Lord, I'm th- thank you? Why can't I just go to you know, the altar and say, thank you, God, for everything that you've given me, for life and breath? Because we oftentimes want to focus on the bad things. Why don't we just come to the altar this morning and say, Lord, thank you, and begin to thank God for your many blessings. What's that song? Count your many blessings. Right? Count them one by one. This morning, as we open, as I open the altar, I'm going to pray, and we're going to open the altar. Just come forward if you want to and just say, Lord, thank you. If you, if you can't make it to the altar, in your chair, just say, thank you, God. If that's all, all that comes to your mouth is just thank you, and you can't think of anything else, just thank him for who he is. And that you're not in charge of your salvation. He is. Right?